The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first Sunday after the Epiphany is always remembered by the reading of one of the gospel accounts of Jesus' baptism by John. It is a story recorded in all four gospels, a sign to us that this was a very important story to the life of the early Christian church. And this year we hear Mark's version of events. Each of the stories of Jesus' baptism in the four Gospels is similar, but each is different as well, highlighting different things about the relationship between Jesus and John. For instance, Matthew and Luke portray John as someone akin to the prophet Elijah preaching repentance and reform to Israel in preparation for the coming of the Lord. In John's gospel, the message of repentance is all but gone, but John is portrayed as one whose main function is to prepare the way for Jesus. In Mark, our gospel reading for today, more so than the other Gospels, John the Baptist is the herald of the stronger one, the mightier one, the one who is coming after him. As we hear in today's Gospel reading, again, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, to be clear, this is something all the gospel accounts of Jesus' baptism say in essentially the same way, right down to the talk about the thongs of sandals. But it is, for Mark, the primary difference between Jesus and John. Mark would have us know that Jesus, not John, Jesus is the one with true strength and power. And strangely enough, it is this scene of Jesus coming to be John, baptized by John 
in the Jordan River, that from Mark, we see this really for the first time in Mark's gospel, Jesus's power and his strength on display. Now, certainly we will see as Mark's gospel progresses, we will see the strength and power of Jesus on display throughout Mark's telling of the Jesus story. We'll see and hear about healings and exorcisms and confrontations with the authorities. We'll see Jesus exercise power with his disciples in dealing with their misunderstanding about who he is and what his mission and purpose is all about, just to name a few. Yet I think it's safe to say that power and strength are not the first things that come to mind when one thinks of the baptism of Jesus. It is not in any overt sense a scene that points to Jesus's power and strength on display, nor I think would it have seemed that way to Jesus. It's hard to imagine that before coming to John to be baptized, even if John had been saying that one who is more powerful than I is coming, and even assuming Jesus knew of John saying this, it's hard to imagine that Jesus would have thought of himself or his act of coming to be baptized as an act of power or strength. As a preacher, having preached on this story many times, I can't remember ever giving much attention to this detail of the relationship between Jesus and John. I assume I've always sort of chalked it up to the kind of flowery language that the gospel writers often tend to put in the mouths of the characters in their stories about Jesus. Jesus is strong. Jesus is powerful, stronger and more powerful than John the baptizer. Of course he is. That's obvious, right? But was it? Was it obvious then? Was it obvious to the people of the early Christian church, the early Jesus movement? And is it obvious to us now? I'm not so sure. We know it was an important point, again, that all the gospel writers made and we know it was the point primarily for Mark. Yet there is nothing overtly obvious in this story having to do with power or strength that one can point to. Now, perhaps one would point to the voice from heaven, right? Or the voice that Jesus hears proclaiming, you are my son, the beloved with you I am well pleased as evidence that Jesus is the stronger and more powerful of the two. Yet, if that were the main point of these words, we have other examples of this that would at least on the surface be more obvious examples of power and strength. For example, at the story of the transfiguration, Jesus on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, Elijah and Moses appear, Jesus begins to be transfigured before them, uh, the voice proclaims him the beloved son. And then later, less obvious, but nonetheless, for Mark, an important point at the very end, at the cross, from the lips of none other than a representative of all earthly power, strength, and might, the Romans, from the lips of a centurion. Truly, this was God's son. Not to mention the way Mark tells this story. The voice 
proclaiming Jesus, the beloved son, is heard, it, it appears, maybe, I, it's not real clear, but is it only heard by Jesus? It's directed to Jesus. You are my son. With you, I am well pleased. So if only Jesus hears the voice, how can anyone else hear, much less know and interpret that the declaration that he is God's son, the beloved, fulfills what John has said about Jesus, that he is more powerful. No, there really is nothing about the baptism of Jesus that tells us that it has anything to do with him being powerful or strong. Except we are not hearing the story of Jesus' baptism in some sort of vacuum in which we don't know anything else about his life, right? Indeed, we, we do, like Paul Harvey used to say, know the rest of the story. We know of his compassion. We know of his mercy. We know of his many encounters with people on the margins, the sick, the destitute, the ostracized, the weak, the demon-possessed, we know these stories of the voice proclaiming him beloved from the mountaintops and from the lips of a Roman centurion. And we do know the ongoing story, perhaps most importantly, we know the ongoing story of his resurrected life in the people of God that make up his church. We know the many examples throughout history of those whose lives have themselves been examples of power and strength, the power and strength of Jesus, not because those people were overtly strong or powerful, but because the one they called Lord was and is and ever shall be. As the church sings in the Sanctus, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. In other words, we know that when it comes to Jesus, often what looks like anything but an example of power and strength is, in fact, just that. Conversely, we know too that what far too often passes for power and strength in the world in which Jesus lived, as well as the world in which we live, seldom has anything to do with power and strength. Rarely has this been more on display for us to see and experience than it was on Wednesday of the week that we just lived through. When our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. was attacked and overrun by fellow citizens who vastly confused what power and strength are. And what's more, confused as to how power and strength are to be properly expressed. Let me be clear, brothers and sisters, because I feel I must. I watched the events of Wednesday, as I know you did, with horror and disgust and fear and anger, an anger that I can only pray was righteous, but 
I don't know if it was because I was just angry and I still am. So I confess that to you. I also though viewed them with some measure of guilt in my heart with the realization that I don't think I have done my duty with you in recent years. I realize that I have too often remained silent when I had an obligation to speak truth to you as it relates to things our current president has said or done. I did so, I remained silent largely because of fear, fear that I might give offense to some. And believe me, I beg you, I mean no offense now. But in doing so, I risked leaving you with the impression that some of the words and actions we have seen from Mr. Trump from his time as a candidate in 2016 until the events of this past week were anything other than wrong and completely at odds with the message of the gospel, not to mention every value we as followers of Christ hold true and dear. And specifically, what I mean is the kind of rhetoric that leads unhinged people to hear and then act upon that rhetoric. And in the process, people are hurt emotionally and physically hurt and in some cases killed. And the very fabric of our common life as fellow citizens is irreparably harmed. We must be unequivocal brothers and sisters. As followers of Christ, we must say in no uncertain terms that there can be no rationalizations for such behavior. Violence is not strength. Hatred is not power. What we saw in the people's house on Wednesday was nothing short of evil. Loathsome and vile behavior. Sadly, but not surprisingly, spurred on not only by our president, but by others in positions of public trust. Trust. Trust that has been eroded. People in positions of public trust who failed to live into that trust and who have deceived those that they are called to serve. We the people. It was fueled by racist, anti-Semitic, and white nationalist ideologies, and it was in every conceivable way un-American, inhuman, and for those that follow the way of Jesus, it is and was unchristian. We as a nation and all the peoples of the earth will be feeling its ramifications as yet unclear for years to come. It was not strong, it was weak. It was not powerful, it was pathetic. 
and may God have mercy on us all. As no doubt God does. When things happen, such as what happened in our nation's capital this past week, God grieves for God's people. God has mercy on us. For Wednesday, January 6th, was also, as you know, the Feast of the Epiphany. Though this fact was no doubt something most people were probably unaware of. Epiphany, light, revelation, revelation for a people who walked in a land of deep darkness. On them, light has shined. Perhaps even in a moment of national mourning and sadness over what has happened and what has become of our shared destiny as citizens, we have been again given by God the opportunity for clarity and vision to once again see the light of God's love in the face and in the person of Jesus Christ. To once again see the light of God's love in the face and in the person of one another, of all people, of our fellow citizens here in this country and all fellow citizens of the earth. It is an opportunity to be reminded that his strength, his power is ours to share with the world, to show the world a better way, another way, a way in which power is shown in compassion, a way in which strength is shown in love. As we were reminded today in the words of the psalm, the Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beautiful.
the throne. 